Morris Henry Hewlett was a British novelist, born in 1861 in Weybridge, the eldest son of Henry Gay Hewlett, keeper of the land revenue records and enrolments, an office dedicated to giving advice on matters of medieval law between 1865 and 1896. Morris was educated in the London International College, becoming a lawyer in 1891. Following his father's resignation, he succeeded him as Keeper of the Land Revenue Records, a post which he held until 1901. In 1888, he married Hilda Beatrice Herbert, the first woman in the UK to receive a pilot's license, but the couple, after having two children, separated in 1914. In 1898, following the success of his historical novel The Forest Lovers, he retired from active legal practice and devoted himself to full-time writing. His circle of friends included such people as Ezra Pound and J.M. Barry. Hewlett died in 1923. Morris Hewlett was most well known for his historical novels, though in his 1913 The Law of Proserpine he actually claimed that not only do fairies exist, but that he met them personally numerous times, and even that he had had somewhat of a long-winded affair with the daughter of Poseidon. The Law of Proserpine is certainly a very odd book, and is certainly at odds with the majority of Hewlett's output. The title character, the Roman springtime goddess Proserpina, though claimed to be somewhat of a goddess ruling over all the fairies, only features in the final chapter of the book in passing. The beginning of the book itself talks about a tenant no one ever sees who has his windows replaced with a mysterious glass that alters perception, but that's rather spoiled by being revealed to be nothing more than an allegory. The next two stories, quote-unquote, if they may be so called, are steeped deep with personal anecdotes of Hewlett's life, and the actual encounters, as he describes them, make one think that at the very least Hewlett himself may have believed them to have been genuine, if by nothing else than from the way they just end abruptly without any sort of a payoff. A writer trying to weave a story would, and should have, used the image of a pale elven boy with gleaming, dark, pupilless eyes torturing a rabbit, or a story of seeing two lesbian fairies on Parliament Hill as a preface to further fantastic adventurings. But Hewlett doesn't, all the while repeating to us how everything he says happened and how he saw it. Later on, he does slip into the model of a conventional storyteller giving quote-unquote other people's accounts of fairy child nappings or of wooing the spirit of a tree during a storm, and these are full stories with the beginning, middle, and end. Sometimes he puts himself into the story too, and indeed, what can one say to the supposed authenticity of a crowd of Londoners gathering by some supernatural foresight in a park at night to accost a messenger boy? All because he's probably the god Hermes and can fulfill fortunes, good or bad, by the telegram he delivers with Hewlett himself seeing a lady he knows help a friend make her petition. Or his claim coming suddenly at the tail end of a different narrative that he was present in a house where a woman gave birth to a fairy child fathered by the spirit of a rose and then that the said child disappeared. The parts of this book which aspire towards the analytical while preaching the existence of fairies are the dullest part of the whole affair, apart from those sections where Hewlett unironically asserts that the Greek gods do exist in some tangible fashion. And after all, if he believed he had fooled around with one of them for a lengthy period of time, it would probably have been bad form to tell her her daddy was just a figment of her imagination, and then again, so was she. Upon completion, one has to pause and wonder about Hewlett. On one hand, the inclusion of quote-unquote borrowed stories he had no part in beyond claiming to have seen or met the person in question, or someone known to them years later, and the rather shocking claim that there were in 1913 a quarter million fairy wives in England plucked out of sea or meadow, and thus without documentation, one should add, leads one to lean on the side of a bet or an intentional bit of ribaldry. On the other hand, the earlier parts of the book have that shaky quality lacking in proper setup and delivery seen so often in the works of theosophists and other spiritualists who claim the non-corporeal is real, which makes me rather uncertain as to what I should even think about all this.